morning, everyone. And good morning to our Zoomers. Can you see them? Can you wave to them a little bit so that they know they're part of us and we know we are part of them? It's great to be back after my time away and to see you all. And um, you'll notice that up here we are wearing masks because we're sitting in close quarters and singing. But I'm going to leave that to you to be optional in your place. If you feel uncomfortable where you are, you can move. Um, I think it's always a good thing to wear masks, but we're kind of trying to grow into a new reality here. And so um, if you're sitting close together, you might want to have one on. Otherwise, we're so delighted that we have Bishop Bob Eloff with us once more again. and. Um, it's always such a pleasure to have him, and I, I already heard his sermon once, and I know you all love it, so welcome. And now for our opening hymn, number one. the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we and magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen.
let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts, for as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Jeremiah. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, come go down to the potter's house and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house and there he was working at his wheel. The vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand and he reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. Can I not do with you, O house of Israel, just as this potter has done, says the Lord? Just like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. At one moment, I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck up and break down and destroy it. But if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will change my mind about the disaster that I intended to bring on it. And at another moment, I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plan it. But if it does evil in my sight, not listening to my voice, then I will change my mind about the good that I had intended to do it. Now, therefore, say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, look, I am a potter shaping evil against you and devising a plan against you. Turn now, all of you, from your evil way and amend your ways and your doings. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
A reading from Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Apphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith towards the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love. And I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I want, wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me, if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owning, owing me even your own self. Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches.
of our Savior Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of our Lord. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Labor Day is not a prayer book holy day, but it ought to be. And it's about labor and its relationship to our life in Christ that I want to think with you today. So unlike usual, where I base my sermon on one or more of the lessons, I'm not going to comment on the apostasy of Israel as seen in Jeremiah and God's threat to remake his people in a new mold. I'm not tempted to talk about Philemon, this short letter which manifests, among other things, the fact that even Paul had a passive-aggressive streak because he, uh, he of course, admonishes uh, his friend Philemon to take back his servant who has run away, his slave who has run away, whose name, by the way, Onesimus means useful, and he talks about him being useless, but now he's useful. Uh, but just in case uh, Philemon forgets, he owes his own soul to Paul, but I'm going to refrain from commenting on that. And uh, I'm not even going to get get sucked into commenting on Jesus' obvious overstatements in today's gospel designed for us to be caught off guard. Give up everything? Really, Jesus? Hate our brothers and sisters and our mother and father? Well, if we love any of these things ahead of Jesus, then that's where we get in trouble. But I'm not going to talk about that. I want to talk about work because Anglicans particularly, and Episcopalians in this country, should understand the theological importance of work. Now, Labor Day goes back to 1882, and it was established in our country largely to give credit to labor unions who were struggling to make the workplace a more humanized place, uh, avoiding um, the detriment Uh, detrimental working conditions and a lot of the excesses that led to dire poverty uh, and still do to some degree. But regardless of what you think about labor unions, I invite you to think today about your work. As I said last week and often say these days, Christianity is a lived religion. It isn't just what we believe, It isn't just the creeds we attend to, it's how we lead our lives, 
What we do is very important. If our faith doesn't change our behavior, there is something dramatically wrong with our Christianity. God has given us work to do. This is clear in Genesis when after the creation of humankind, God puts the man and the woman to work in the Garden of Eden. Well, the Garden of Eden never existed. The Garden of Eden is the world as we know it, and that's where we are to do our work. We are among all other creatures God has created, the only ones he has called into working side by side that we might bring in a new day and bring his kingdom to bear on our world. Work is holy. Throughout the gospel, Jesus and Paul, for that matter, accentuate the importance of being able to see the fruits that we bear, the work that we're doing, and the way in which we are helping God to bring in a new day of reconciliation, justice, peace, compassion to our neighbor, and in all ways, work calls us to cooperate in community. Anglicans and Episcopalians should understand this entirely on the basis of our rich heritage, which whether we consciously know it or not, owes a great deal to Benedictine spirituality. In England during the Middle Ages, you would likely have been worshiping in a Benedictine community that was the local monastery or convent in your neighborhood. And Benedictines have always accentuated ora et labora, prayer and work. And the two are not mutually exclusive. The day is punctuated with both work and prayer so that hopefully our work life might carry over into our prayer life and our prayer life might affect our work. We call the Book of Common Prayer, which we use, even if we don't know we're using it with the leaflet, we're actually using the Book of Common Prayer. And it has been long established in our tradition that common prayer or our corporate worship is much more important than private devotion. More important, because we do it together. We are, as a church, profoundly Benedictine, whether we realize it or not. And Benedict had a great deal to say about the importance of work. But before I turn my attention to that, I just want to say a few other things about the nature of work. In our baptism, Jesus calls each of us into vocation. Vocation comes from the Latin vocare, to call. And we used to kind of refer to somebody having a call if they were going to be wearing a collar like Thelma or myself, or possibly were going into the medical profession or teaching. But you don't have to be doing something in relationship directly to helping your neighbor to be answering a call. Every human being has a calling, a vocation. It's based on the talents and abilities that we've been given. My favorite definition comes from Fred Beekner, a Christian educator who years ago said that vocation is where your deep joy meets a world, one of the world's great needs. Wherever your joy meets a need of your brothers and sisters, there is your vocation. When I meet, as I always do, with teenagers before I confirm them, I make a point of talking with them about vocation because they're at a great time to be thinking about what brings them great joy and how can that be pointing the way to their vocation. I was very fortunate when I headed off to college, my father, who was a man of few words, said something to me which I have never forgotten. He said, find something that really gives you joy. Find something that you will really find satisfaction in. Doesn't matter whether you make a lot of money. What makes the difference is whether you enjoy what you're doing. That was wonderfully liberating in a culture in those days for me 
that could put a lot of pressure on young people, and we still do, to go out and make money and to be successful in all kinds of worldly ways. But the real secret to vocation is finding that which gives you joy in the doing of it, which means that you will be involved in a lot of self-sacrifice. Any of us who have higher education are aware that it was necessary to reach the goals we wanted to reach, to apply ourselves, to make sacrifices. And that does tie in with the gospel and with our gospel hymn about taking up your cross. It means taking up the opportunity, making sacrifices, so that the work you do will bring you joy. I want to read, and I'll be shorter on this than I was at the 8 o'clock service, because I think it was a little too long, a reading from Joan Chittister. Uh, Joan Chittister is a popular author. Uh, She is a Benedictine nun, and she also does a lot of public speaking. But in one of her earlier books called Wisdom Distilled from the Daily, which means wisdom distilled from daily life, she talks about the the, um, rule of St. Benedict and she has a whole chapter on work. And these are some of the things she says. Work is not for profit. Work is not to enable me to get ahead. The purpose of work is to enable me to get more human and to make my world more just. There are two poles pulling at the modern concept of work. One pole is workaholism and the other pole is pseudo-contemplation. The workaholic does not work to live, the workaholic lives to work. The motives are often confusing and sometimes even misleading. Some workaholics give their entire lives to work because they have learned in a pragmatic culture that what they do is the only value they have. Many workaholics don't work for work sake alone, they work for money, and more money, and more money. Other workaholics work simply to avoid having to do other things in their life. Work is a shield that protects them from having to make conversation, or spend time at home, or broaden their social skills. As a parish priest for many years, I sometimes had to counsel some of my most active church people, that God was no longer calling them to throw themselves into the volunteerism of the church, that given their home situation, that was becoming an escape for them, and what they really needed to do was to pay attention to what was going on on at home. So I let that float out there just in case you're beginning to feel overburdened by things the church asks you to do, but I'm not trying to discourage people from accepting church jobs, or I'd be out of a job. Um, She continues, pseudo-contemplatives, I'm sorry, pseudo-contemplatives, on the other hand, see work as an obstacle to human development. They want to spend their hours lounging or drifting or gazing or processing. They work only to sustain themselves and even then as little as possible. Pseudo-contemplatives say they are seeking God in mystery, but as a matter of fact, they are actually missing the presence of God in the things that give meaning to daily life. The biggest shock of all in my early years in the convent was that novices were not permitted to go to the chapel between regular times of prayer were not permitted. Now what kind of place is this? Here I was, set to get instant holiness and impress the novice mistress at the same time, but someone had apparently figured out that both motives and had moved to block the whole idea. In fact, they had something better in mind for us all. They wanted us to work. In the Beck In Benedictine spirituality, work is what we do to continue with God, to continue what God wants done. Work is cooperative. Keeping a house that is beautiful and ordered and nourishing and artistic is co-creative. Working in a machine shop 
that makes gears for tractors is co-creative, working in an office that processes loan applications for people who are themselves trying to make life more humane is co-creative. There are no dearth of ways in which you can serve God. I think of my son who is an auto mechanic and in his 50s. From the time he was a little boy, he showed unusual ability to um, take things apart and put them back together. Uh, these were genes that I did not inherit myself because if I don't get something right back together again, I throw it out and buy a new one. But, um, but even as a little boy, my son would spend hours trying to figure out how it worked, how it went back together. So by the time he was in junior high, we advocated for him going to a technical high school where he majored in automotive. And it has been his vocation. In fact, I'm only sorry that he lives in Boston because it's too far away to take my car. But he is one of these, he owns his own business and he is one of these rare mechanics who listens to an engine and decides something is not right and he will just rack his brain trying everything possible to figure out what is not perfect about what I'm hearing. Um, it is his true vocation. So vocations don't have to be something churchy and Lord knows auto mechanics fill a great need in the life of the world. As do most people, it's usually easy to find something that gladdens your heart and is pointing the way to your vocation that also is going to benefit others. And I am aware as someone who still keeps seeking where God is calling me, that vocation doesn't end when you retire. In fact, one of the reasons I think a lot of retirees go immediately downhill physically, mentally, and in some other ways, often dying quite young um, into their retirement is because they haven't been open to the reality that God isn't finished with them yet, that there are things to do. No matter how old or how infirm you may become, God can still use you if you seek those things that bring you joy. I have seen this happen in so many older people. And now I'm looking at this again myself. I'm 81 years old and next year at this time, I will be unemployed again. And I'm kind of looking forward to that in one way. I love being the assisting bishop in Maryland, but I think I'm reaching the age where that doesn't sound like as realistic a thing to keep doing. So I'm looking at the possibility of writing or doing spiritual direction or in a variety of other ways because I know God isn't finished with me yet. Somewhere in the things that bring me deep joy, I will find a call. And if I'm lucky, I will be able to keep following that call until the day I don't wake up. Um, and I would hope that for each of you. We have a divine invitation to be helpmates of God. Each of us has a vocation which may change dramatically over time. Each of us is called to receive joy. Finally, I might just comment that people who are following their vocations, even though they often give a great deal of themselves, never suffer from burnout. Burnout is when you continue doing something that is not nourishing you. But if it great, gives you great joy, then you don't have to worry about burnout. You may have to make sure you also attend to other things like family and friends and pets and whatever, but you, uh, you won't burn out. People who burn out are giving that which they're no longer replenishing. They're somehow giving, but they're not receiving the joy that would strengthen them. Ministry and work are always a two-way street. If it's the right thing for us to do, then it will be feeding us even as we extend ourselves, even sacrificially, to feed others. Work is our vocation, and Labor Day ought to be a Christian holiday in which we celebrate the ability we have to work with God for a better world. Amen.
Now, if you will please stand. And let us confess our faith in this God who gives us work, which is so much a part of our lives. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. We believe in the Holy Spirit, 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 the Holy
Phoenix DeVale, Irene Hardy, Stephanie Brooks Wiggins, Tijon Cox and family, Rodney Michael, Brian Wagner, Tim Wolf, Fred Bowling, Catherine Williamson, Sack Shevajewski, Alex Stone, Gordon Pichet, Vicki Lynn Faustnock, Debbie McClellan, Patricia Williams, 40 West Assistance and Referral Center clients, those affected by the coronavirus, the homeless, and any others we name at this time. Hear their bodies and their souls. Bless all with life and prosperity. Christ in your mercy. We remember in our prayers all those who have died, including William D. Penn, Mildred R. Hoke, Bill Knowles, and any others we name at this time. Thomas Nancy. Fields, Clinton Bowser, Julian Fro, and oh, Jeremiah my. Brogdon. Barbara. May all who have carried the cross in the way of Christ also be raised with him to new life. Christ in your mercy. Show your goodness, O Lord, and hear our prayers. Look past our selfish desires and remember your own faithfulness. In your compassion, consider our petitions, and in your mercy, do in our lives that which is truly good. We pray in the name of your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit reigns one God now and forever. Amen. Amen. Confess our sins against God and our neighbor. God of all mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you, opposing your will in our lives. We have denied your witness to each other, in ourselves and in the world we have created. We repent of the evil that enslaves us, the evil we have done. Have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Oh, please sit down. At this time, it's our habit, our custom at this time of year, as our new school terms begin, that we have a blessing on all those who are involved in education. Now, in some ways, we all are, that is true. But in particular, if you are a teacher, if you are a student, if you work for the school systems, if you are even, if you cook the food, if you are a part of our school system, I'd like you to stand up and I, we have our bishop here and we can ask Bishop Bob to give a special blessing for all those and we have a lot. Let us pray. O Lord, we give you thanks for those who study and those who learn, those who teach them, and those who work in supportive activities to support all who are students. We give you thanks for this city and for its many institutions of learning, and particularly for our public schools. We ask your blessing on them and our school teachers. Bless our teachers and our students Bless their families, bless all who assist in teaching in this city. 
Help them to see this as their vocation and find great joy therein. May the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be on those of you who are engaged in education, now and always. Amen. Amen. And now if you'll stand for the peace. The peace of Christ be always with you. And also with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, peace be with you all. It's good to see you all back here. Not that you. Peace. Peace to all of you. Hey. God's peace to everyone. Peace, peace and blessings. Everyone. Peace, church. Peace, everyone. Peace, everyone. Good to see all of you. I'm Aaron Lou. Good. Yeah. Good to see you. Bonnie. God peace. God peace. See you. Hi, Ray. Hi. Peace, honey. Peace, everyone. I'm Hi, uh, Keith. You did a great job reading. Let's go. Heather, I'm good to see you. In your name, I just can't see your face. <laughs> Sandra. Some good news. I'm looking out there, first of all, to see if there's anybody out there that I haven't seen before. I don't think so, but then again, my eyes are growing dimmer as Bob was talking about this. So if you are here for the first time, <laughs> or, or a second time, or a hundred million time, it's great that we all can be here together and to look out and see your faces and um, we're settling in now to a new way of life, and um, with, we're living with COVID as we live with the flu, and we live with everything else that goes around, so we just learn to do that graciously and the best we can. So, I know you all are waiting to hear the news. A few of you do know it. Every, almost everybody sitting here today was on these grounds yesterday. No, mostly, not everybody. Okay, at the, at the moment, because it's probably going to grow, David, who was keeping the money, told me we have $13,500. I got to tell you, so I see right now sitting out there the two co-chairs of our flea market, Mary Helen Sprecher and Deb Wacker. I want you two to stand up. And where is Celeste? And Celeste, Celeste, are you here? I thought I saw Celeste earlier. But Celeste has walked right next to them all the way. Now, all right, so if you brought anything to be sold, stand up. If you showed up to help yesterday, stay standing or stand up. All right, I see a few more. If you bought anything and that, you know. Okay, more boss, like me, me too. Um, did you bake anything for yesterday? Or dig up a plant for yesterday? Or most of all, sort things in the heat of the summer. You get an extra special <laughs> award. So, okay, you can sit down. We can applaud for each other. It's what a wonderful, wonderful way to be together, to enjoy each other again in this new world, to serve our community yesterday, and then to continue to serve them with monies that we made that will go back out to to help other people in our community. It's just, I've said before, it's a win, 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 win thing. And that's all we can say about that. Thank you, thank you God, for the nice weather. And thank you, oh my gosh, did I forget the most important thing? God was here, for sure, Jesus was here. So, I would like, I would like to announce the guest preacher and celebrant for next week, but, um,
It's, she's not really a guest. So guess what? Flo will be back on next Sunday. So that means that, yes, that each of you that is in this pew today is going to be in this pew next week, right? And you're going to bring others so that when Flo comes back, she not only looks out at those faces that she knows and loves, but she may have to figure out some new faces. Wouldn't that be good? So be here, make sure you come back. Doesn't it make all the difference? As, as the bishop said, we, the most important thing is to pray in community. And we're in community, and that's what's so important. So thank you, Bob for coming back. We, I can tell you something that you can do when you have to retire again. <laughs> you can come here and preach on occasion. And how about that? <laughs> because we'll always have you. That will be a delight. Uh, it'll be a delight. Well, we love it. <laughs> All right. Did I miss anything that I really needed to announce? Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and give glory to God who is in heaven.
Christ be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All thanks and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God. Through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, the wisdom from on high, by whom you created all things, you laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst forth from the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, Holy One of blessing, all you create is a sign of the hope for our journey. And so, in the mor as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings with all creation as we shout with joy. <laughs> creator of all. Your word has never been silent. You called a people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life, to proclaim the coming of your holy reign, and give himself for us a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin, brought us into our life, reconciled us to you, and restored us to the glory you intended for us. We thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant of my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so remembering all that we, you have done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory and presenting to you these gifts, your earth has formed and human hands have made. We acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ, and in the fullness of time, gather us with blessed Bartholomew and all the people, and all your people, into the joy of your eternal true home. Through Christ, and with Christ and in Christ, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Blessed are you now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today.
Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. And now for those of you at home who are sharing with the agape meal, let us pray together. Blessed are you, O Lord our God. You bring forth bread from the earth and make the risen Lord to be for us the bread of life. Grant that we who daily seek the bread which sustains our bodies may also hunger for the food of everlasting life, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now with your cup of wine or whatever drink you have, blessed are you, O Lord our God, creator of the fruit of the vine. Grant that we who share this drink, which gladdens our hearts, may share forever the new life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray and say together on page, the top of page 18. In union, O God, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, wherever they may be, we offer you praise and thanksgiving. We remember your death, Lord Christ. We proclaim your resurrection. We await your coming to glory. No matter how we have received you today in our meal of communion, whether by sacrament or otherwise, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. Let us bring us in your grace of Holy Spirit, and let us never be separated from you. May we live with you and you in us, now and always, wherever we are. Amen. Amen. Into the pe- go, go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Minister to the afflicted. Find your vocation and live into it. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.
we go forth into the world, refreshed and renewed, we reaffirm our commitment to our vision and mission as a congregation. We will, with God's help, be a vibrant faith community that is a place of God's transforming love for the world. God has called us to take righteous risks. We accept this call and will respond by speaking and serving Christ in all people. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us go forth to love and serve the Lord. Amen.